You're listening to a podcast produced by the Ocular Research by Integrated Training and Learning, or Orbital Project. This project is funded by the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program. To find out more, visit our website at www.orbital-itn.eu. So good afternoon, everyone. You are very welcome to the Research Brown Bag series. So this is the first session in the spring summer series here um, between ourselves and ITC. So I am absolutely delighted to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Larry Fitzhenry. Well, thanks, Emer, for uh, asking me along today. And thank everybody for, for joining, uh, for giving me a chance. Before I start, I'm actually say you might want to lower the volume on your uh, laptop or PC. I still haven't worked out how to talk at a, an appropriate Zoom <laughs> volume yet, and it sounds like I'm trying to reach you from where I am to wherever you are shouting across the country. But um, So uh, just to save your ears. But look, again, as I said, thanks for having me here today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about de delivering or developing drug delivery strategies for ocular therapeutics and the work that we're doing in the ocular therapeutics research group. So this work would have, I suppose, started... Uh, a good number of years ago, and um, there was work going on in the PMBRC and my own PhD under the supervision of uh, Pat Dogan, now retired, and uh, Peter McDoughton would have been working on starting the development of microparticles and, and looking at the potential for releasing drugs to the eye. And from there, the postdoc, as, as Emer said, and working with um, Helen Hughes, Orla Donovan, and, and, and Niall, and uh, a lot of the team in the PMBRC would have been looking at this. So really want to kind of take you through maybe some of that and, and where we where we're at today and the kind of stuff that we focus on. Like I suppose so in in the imaginatively entitled Ocular Therapeutics Research Group, what are we focusing on? We want to investigate, design and develop drug delivery technologies for treatment of ocular disease. Okay. And um, I suppose we're in that, what we really want to do is to develop a multidisciplinary and intersector intersectoral research group and to train people to have the skills necessary to develop these new therapeutics for, for, for ocular conditions. And, and, and not just the therapeutics, but also the delivery of those therapeutics. So I suppose that's the, what we want to do. And, and, and if we take a look at the why, um, it's really around the, the, the global impact of ocular disease. I suppose we probably all suspect it, but it's also statistically and scientifically recorded that you know, the potential to lose sight or issues with vision is, is pretty high up there on the fears of, of, of most humans. And I think it's only second or third below things like cancer and so on. And I suppose that's, you know, a little bit kind of, uh, you know, something to keep note of when you see so many people. And I've taken this from the WHO and the Global Vision Database and a couple of other references you'll see at the end. While these numbers, you can get kind of different numbers um, in different places. What I've tried to focus on here is, here are the total numbers, so you can see cataract 94 million, but 15.2 million cause of blindness. So those in the brackets are the cases of, of, of blindness from these diseases. Okay, so you can see pretty high incidence of the diseases and then and the conditions, and then obviously significant amount of blindness around this too. So the majority of people then with vision impairments and our vision impairment and blindness are, are over 50. And well, there's lots of different things around uh, gender and, and, and the impact on vision. Really, you know, what there is, and we're looking at different impacts and in our research, you know, around gender and, and the treatment and then the incidence in, in those cases. One of the main things is really aging. And, and, and hopefully that's something we'll all be lucky enough to do. So, but, but it, within that then, we also have, you know, there, there's a, a growing, I suppose, prevalence of some of these diseases um, and this leads to significant impact on the quality of life and then uh, you know the, the global financial burden of trying to help people and treat people through that so that's I suppose the, the why and the impact on it and, and, and just here's another slide but one of the things to think of or that I'd like to note is that a lot of the treatments actually for the eye work really really well and a lot of the therapeutics actually work well and, and some of those are back of the eye diseases and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about front of the eye diseases and that's probably easiest uh, looking at the anatomy. Now, this was drawn by one of our, our postgrads, Saoirse uh, Casey Power. So this line is usually a little bit closer here. So that's where the posterior, so the, the back chamber starts. But we kind of focus on it here because if we want to get drugs to the back of the eye, we're focusing on things like the retina and the macula and so on. And then we want to get drugs at the front of the eye where really kind of it's, it's really towards the surface and maybe around um, here as well in the an, an anterior chamber here. So I suppose some of the diseases I mentioned earlier are diseases that are would be considered 
posterior segment disease or back of the eye disease. And these are really some of the most uh, impactful in terms of vision and, and sight threatening uh, diseases. And then some of the anterior segment disease, and we'll talk a little bit about dry eye disease later in particular, also impact um, hugely on people and huge numbers of, of, of people in, in, in the world. But again, for these and for those posterior segment treatment <clears throat> or diseases, the treatments are quite good. <clears throat> Excuse me, but there's a significant challenge in getting those treatments to where they need to be within the eye. So if we just take this image of the eye, we have our anterior segment and our posterior segment. Segment. If you even take trying to get a drug to the front of the eye, for example, if it's just a, a, an eye infection or maybe some inflammation in the eye, the first thing that encounters is tear film. And in this tear film alone, you already have three different layers. You have a lipid or a fat layer. You've got an aqueous and a mucus, mucus layer. And this tear film is being washed away constantly. And even if you manage to get past that with the drug, uh, there is also, or the therapeutic, there's the, the corneal layer where you have different... Uh, I think there's five different layers in the cornea and so on towards the back of the eye. So the eye is really designed quite well to keep everything out. And for most of us and for most of the time, it does that job. And that's great. But when we want to get a therapeutic to it or a drug to it, it also pushes it away and keeps it away. And, and that's part of, of the challenge of it. So even if we have a really good drug for a specific condition, it can be difficult to get it to that particular site and to that particular area. So some of the conventional routes for, for ocular drug delivery um, and more recently supercoroidal and periocular are, are, are taken, are, are of interest to drug delivery uh, scientists. But typically what we're looking at is topical, so eye drops. You can also use gels and ointments, but some of the problems with gels and ointments are that if they stay on the eye well, they, they also blur the vision. But usually for topical drops, only, only 5% or less than 5% of the therapeutic gets to the site of action. And that's if it's at the front of the eye because you have tear turnover, which washes it away. Uh, and you've got all those barriers that we discussed earlier. But then if you want to try to get to the back of the eye, it's somewhere around 0.1%. So intravitreal injection, so injections into the vitreous. And, and just to qualify, I'm not a clinician, uh, as I'm sure most of you know me, I'm a, I'm a chemist at best. So um, I'm, I'm coming at it from a, the, the the perspective of a chemist and a drug delivery scientist rather than a clinician. So bear with me if I don't, if, 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 if I don't go into too much detail in some aspects of the diseases and the conditions and so on. But in the vitreous of the eye, which is, I suppose, uh, <clears throat> made up of things like hyaluronic acid and collagen, this injection is really quite good. And, and I suppose it is, however, there, there are some side effects and so on. Though most of the times you get an intravitreal injection, it's for a potentially sight-threatening disease. And, and, and to be honest, most of the people that we've spoken to over the last few years, if it's an injection into the eye, which I won't leave, I'll, I'll leave this up uh, for a very short period of time, or a contact lens to deliver that drug, you know, the, 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 it's not as much of a concern if the option is, is losing some sight loss. So I suppose with that little bit of context and background, what is it that we focus on um, in the OTRG? And we look at, I suppose, different ways of taking drugs to the eye and getting those drugs to stay within the eye. And in that case, we look at a range of these different technologies, so contact lens, nanoparticles, which we talk about different types of materials. And um, we, we're starting to look more and more with you know, new or repurposed therapeutics or combinations of existing therapeutics. And we want to look at the models um, which will help us know that something we make in the lab can, can work in the human body, or if we're looking at animal health, in, in, in animal health as well. So, and, and, and one of our, our, our key drivers in that is that we're, we're really focusing on more and more this patient-directed research and involving the patient in the research that we, that we work on. So I'm gonna probably talk a little bit about the contact lens aspect of it first. And, and this is where we, where we started our research really. And I mentioned cataracts earlier. So once you get a cataract, very simple operation in, 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 in uh, the Western world and developed worlds, um, you know, so, so it's most people, it's, it's a routine operation and people go in and come out the next day or even the same day, in fact. But you have to add a drop to your eye to prevent inflammation and infection up to every hour after that for, for a day, then every four hours, then every eight hours, and, and, and pretty much for about 30 days um, is what's used. So as you can imagine, many people who have cataracts, they're slightly... Uh, in the older demographic, they may not have the same mobility. So to put drops in all the time can be quite uh, problematic. And I know one friend of mine, um, that despite the fact that he's, he's happy to jump out of planes in his, in, in his well into his 70s, 
when he had his cataract surgery, he had to get a lot of help to, to, to get those drops in uh, regularly enough. So we want to look at, well, if we could take a contact lens, you know, something like this, which could be placed on the eye, well, then would that make it easier for people to get that treatment? And this little chamber is what we started with here. It was our former postgrad, now head of the department, uh, David Phil in, in, in Carlo, uh, head of department of science. And he developed this so that we could make contact lenses. Um, and the idea here is if you have a contact lens with a drug, it's slowly but you know, surely releases that drug to where it's needed at the surface of the eye. Okay, so we started by taking a look at putting some, uh, well, we were making microparticles at the time and we wanted to see if we make them smaller. And, and these are slightly bigger than the ones we used, but I always use this picture because it uh, makes me smile because it always looked like there was a dog made out of the microparticles. So 10, 11 years later, I'm still using this picture. <clears throat> but we, we, we did it, we put drug into that and it was a corticosteroid small molecule. We put it into these particles and it was designed to release the drug over a period of time. We put it into the contact lens and we were able to see that we could release that drug at a therapeutic dose uh, up to about two or three days and then a, a kind of a maintained dose later. So that meant they would get the dose they need and then it would, would stay, uh, it would reduce then like you would if you were adding drops, it would reduce in dosage at this stage. So it was, it was, it was nice results. There wasn't a whole lot really that people had achieved in that um, in this particular area for that particular drug at the time. Um, but we couldn't see through the contact lens. The particles were too big. So this is a, an old image from a, what was I suppose, considered a smartphone about 10 years ago or, or, or more, probably more at this stage of losing track of time. But you can still see that this was a contact lens that you could not see through. So, however, it, it, it got us kind of working towards this contact lens. And, and, and the more, you know, we had the shape, we had the, we had the release that we needed. So we, we were able to start then a project and, and two, uh, one still colleague, colleague of ours, uh, got the Bell, is working in the MBRC as the technology leader and a former colleague, Javed, who's, who's now in the University of Limerick. They started on a project where they're able to make particles much smaller. And you could see, and, and, and I suppose the size of particles is important. So we have a big focus on nanoparticles. And just to give a, a small bit of background on that, and, and I always get this figure wrong, but Let's say that a nanoparticle is about a million times smaller than the width of a hair. And um, so somebody can correct me on that, but something in that range. So very, very small. Um, and but it has because they're so small, they have lots of properties that are, are really useful for drug delivery and many other things. But specifically for drug delivery, they can carry a lot more therapeutics, so a higher payload of drug. They have a higher surface area, but also they can get to sites in the body that other uh, particles wouldn't. They can be, they can get into cells, they can adhere to cells, they can adhere to the surface of the eye and so on. And you can see the difference in the size. So these were in, these were about a thousand times smaller. Yes, I'm right. These were about a thousand times smaller than the ones I had in this image here, which meant that when they were put into the contact lens, we were able to see that it was clear and it wasn't blocking the light. So we were, this was one of our first nanoparticle loaded contact lens and led to this uh, research paper here that the, the, the guys worked on. And you can see, importantly, it was over 80% of the light was able to go through, um, which is the, the industry standard. And the drug was released at a therapeutic uh, dose for over for 22 days was actually what it ended up being. So, so this was really, really kind of promising results. Um, where we are now and the current contact lens projects um, were, really well supported by WIT and a co-fund project and for the Irish Research Council as well. And this is in collaboration with Bosch and Lom. So the two researchers now are Dan, who is, is just, she's pictured here, just finishing her PhD in the next few months. And then Ali, who's just started, so I don't have a picture of him just yet, but, but we will get one. But what we're really focused on here is, and this is linked to a paper that Dan published last year, is how many of the drug delivery researchers are focusing on polymers, which contact lenses are made of, which are basically just plastics, but not taking on the commercial standards or the form of these particles, um, of, of these uh, contact lenses. So they really are just using lumps of plastic, seeing what the drug looks like if it comes out. So Dan is focused on work because we're partnered with, with Bosch and Lam, and they are obviously commercial manufacturers of, I think it could be three out of every five contact lenses sold in the world. Um, and they uh, have really guided us in how we can make a commercial standard contact lens and how we can still have the same lens property. So if you put this on the eye, it would actually be useful. And I'll show just some of the results there. I'll, I'll skip over this. This is just how Dan makes them. But you can see here where we have a blank lens with nothing in it and a pharmaceutical load lens, and you still have the same behavior and the same pattern. But what's important here is these are the parameters that 
people decide, okay, this contact lens is going to sit comfortable on the eye. It's going to be clear enough. Uh, there's enough water in the eye to make it comfortable. It's strong enough so it won't break when you're taking it out of the package. It's, it, it has the right behavior with water so that the water will coat the surface of your, your, your tear film and so on. And you can see that for all of the lenses that Dan prepared, that they work and they, they match these quite well. So we're building on that work and the new project is going to build on that from there as well. And um, you can see that the drug release from before we had for 22 days in this one, for example, we're now focusing on daily disposable lenses that because they're some of the highest, uh, highest uh, so sold and marketed uh, contact lenses. And um, so we're looking at, you know, releasing that drug just for six to eight hours a day and then have an impact. And, and interestingly, the first ever commercially uh, marketed and FDA approved lens, and it's also approved in Canada and Japan, happened last year. So this is from Johnson Johnson. They, they just released and, and their drug releases for five hours, but works for 12 hours. So we're really kind of at the stage where this is starting to become a re reality for uh, in the market and potential options for, for, for people in the future. Um, just, I'm going to talk about one or two examples of, of the work, but here are all of our research, our postgraduate researchers, uh, mine and Sally, because I still haven't got his, his picture here. But um, we have Taha who's working on a COVID-related project just to show that we're using this technology to look at other societal challenges and Dilip who's working on antimicrobial resistance, um, um, you know, uh, bacterial strains. And, and different nano formulations of treating that. So, so a lot of the work I'll be talking about is work that the team here has done and, and really a great team of researchers to be working uh, with. So one of the, the ones, I'm just going to give a couple of examples um, and I'll just go over them pretty quickly. I forgot to st st start my stopwatch, so please, uh, if I'm going on too long, somebody just uh, send me, uh, let a cough, uh, cough or something and I'll, I'll wrap it up. But um, <clears throat> in this case, what we're looking at here is what well, we have looked at focusing on the nanoparticles and the materials we've been working on for years. Here we're looking at combining two therapeutics that have not been used in this way before. So not only will it be a, an innovation in terms of the particle that can be added to the eye in an eye drop and then travel towards the back of the eye, but also we'll use a new therapeutic um, combination. And Madhuri has done a lot of work on this, and this just shows the simple kind of process that's used in the lab, but which can be scaled up to an industrial uh, process. But what's really kind of interesting is the amount of work that Mallory has done to work out that we have, and, and there's a lot of statistics, a lot of experiments, and this is a, a paper that she published last year, but it focuses that, you know, when we change different parameters, we have the right particle size. So now when we have an eye drop that you can add to the eye and it will wash away within minutes, or maybe you have to add another one, these particles have the ability to um, adhere to the surface of the eye. They have the right amount of drug, which is the encapsulation efficiency. They have the right charge to stick to specific parts of the eye. And then they also can go through certain barriers um, uh, depending, I and mean, this is something we're still investigating. So the smaller, the better. So once you're in the low nanometer range, that's, that's always good. Um, this is just, I'll, I'll just go over this one, even though this, this shows just a huge amount of work, I suppose, that was went into designing and developing these. But where the stage right now is where we're investigating this dual combination, we're bringing in things like biomarkers. So um, I suppose, uh, how would I describe as a, I'm a chemist, as a non-biologist. So these are molecules within the body that you know, represent if there's inflammation, for example. So they're markers of inflammation. So Madri has done, developed a lot of work where we can test, make a, a cell, uh, I suppose, call induce inflammation into a cell, and they produce a certain amount of those biomarkers. And then depending on what combination we use, we can see that they reduce. So this just shows that they don't kill the cells. Um, but we've also seen that we've been decreasing some of those biomarkers with our new combination that, that hasn't been seen uh, before. So this led to, to, to Madri's paper from last year. So another interesting one is where we're repurposing therapeutics. And this is led by uh, my colleague, Dr. Shadarani, and all the work is being carried out by Suraj. And we're, this is again, IRC funded in conjunction with uh, collaborators of ours, Experimentica in Finland. Um, and then also there's a, a university in the University of Warwick in the UK is, is, is involved as well. So here, what we're looking at is repurposing a drug that's been used for multiple cirrhosis and tackling age-related macular degeneration. So one of the, the, the leading cause of blindness in people over 50 um, uh, across the world, but 
targeting in a different way. And like I said, I'm no biologist, so I won't focus too much on it. But really what we're looking at here is can, and, and our colleagues in Experimentica will do the, the mouse model, the preclinical model here, where they will induce a, mod, uh, um, uh, a model of this disease and see will our uh, new drug and reformulation of that drug work to reduce it. And I suppose what we've seen here is that it's, it, it's stable in the cells. It doesn't kill the cells. Um, but what, what, what we hope to see is that it's going to not just boost the immune system, but recruit immune cells from systemic circulation. And this then is going to help treat, treat wet AMD in a way that's not being done at the moment. So the last bit of research that I'm going to talk about is one where we're, I suppose, our most advanced, but maybe developed is a better word. It's not an advanced technology. It's a simple technology, but we've been working on it for a good number of years. And this is where we're trying to develop um, treatments for dry eye disease. Like I said, eye drops are great, but they, they don't always work so well. So for example, with dry eye disease, which is, and I'll talk about a little bit in, in a second, how it's caused, but uh, you know, people with dry eye disease, I have I'd mild dry eye myself, and I could use drops maybe five or six times a day. But for people with severe dry eye, they can use drops up to 15 times a day, or even up to four or five times an hour, as well as ointments, as well as different treatments. And it can really be quite debilitating for people and um, with severe dry eye disease. But what we hope to do is to formulate a commercializable eye drop formulation based on nanomaterials that will allow for only two drops a day and will have multiple treatments. So we really want to treat the cascade of inflammation of dry eye. So what I mean by this is, so this is the lipid layer, for example, or the tear film layer, which has those three layers that I talked about. But if there's any breakdown in this, then it could be from injury or medication or possibly even uh, um, uh, di different conditions, it causes this cycle of inflammation. The tear film breaks down, the eye gets inflamed, that causes the tear film to continue to break down and increase the inflammation. Um, and it could be from it could even be breakdown of these meibomian glands, um, which is what caused mine, for example, and nothing will remind you like that you're a, a advancing in middle age than your doctor telling you, well, you're lucky to have that many glands at this age. Lots of people lose more, you know, so... Um, but, but, but it could be something as simple where that lipid layer breaks down so the tear film evaporates. So what we want to do is to develop a formulation that treats everything, reduces the inflammation, increases lubrication of the eye, and then also helps um, that lipid layer to stay on the surface of the eye. So that's what we work on. And I, again, I won't leave this up too long. Um, but really, it's about the breakdown in this tear film. And it can cause really significant issues for people. And, and we've talked a lot recently to not just uh, clinicians, but also so patients and, you know, who think nothing of, of putting on drops 15 times a day. And again, they're just happy if it gets them, gets them through the day, but we want to work on developing that. So uh, I'll, I'll skip over this, but just to say that Sangeeta worked on this at the start and Gotham had put a lot of work into this in the past. And then uh, a number of others, we work with UCD on the most recent round of this. Um, but you can see there's a huge amount of uh, sufferers in the world. I and mean, we, we did a lot of interaction with, with people in the area to see where we doing the right thing. And I'll, I'll, I'll skip over a lot of this, but what we really want to do is what would an ideal drug delivery system look like? And we focused on some aspects of it. So like I said, prolonging that contact time with the target tissue to make it non-irritating and comfortable. One of the main treatments for dry eye is cyclosporin, which causes stinging in the eye and which takes uh, anything up to six months to work. Okay, the less drainage tendency then we wanted to, to, to use as well and um, to make sure that it's dead on the surface of the eye. And recently then we're making it easier to, to, to instill into the eye and then we're looking at making sure it's sterile and so on. And these are just some of the techniques we use and they're the subject of uh, some patents and some publications. Um, but really they're small nanoparticles that contain the drug in a lipid or, you know, like a, a fat nano material um, formed from, from, from biocompatible lipids. Um, and what's important here is we can increase the drug and we decrease the drug stability and the stability of the formulations. We have another version of that, which in this case, this is one of, this is our lead formulation at the moment. So it, it holds the drug in here and delivers the drug, but also it also, it, it's made of components that adhere to the surface of the cell and allows, um, for greater lubrication, it allows other formulation ingredients and um, allow for comfort agents in the eye as well. So this is something that we're working on a lot um, in this. So you can show these are human corneal epithelial cells just grown in a lab. 
And you can see that uh, the fluorescent dye shows that our nanoparticles are being internalized within the cell and on the surface of the cell, even after it's washed away. And we show that again then with an ex vivo, so it's just a, a porcelain cornea. And you can see that when we put the drops on this, again, this is just in a lab. Um, and you can see when there's no nanomaterial, the fluorescent dye is washed away, but when you have a nanomaterial, it stays on the surface of the eye. So this is leading us to, and we're working now towards the, um, I suppose, advanced biomarker stuff. I'll, I'll skip over this, it shows good drug release, it's happening the way we want it. And this shows that it's stable over a six month period at different storage, which would be important for eye drops and uh, uh, any pharmaceutical uh, uh, marketed product. Shed and Madri have done great work in terms of, again, looking at those inflammation biomarkers, inflammatory biomarkers, and it shows that if we compare this to the drug on its own or the nanoparticle on its own, when we combine the two of them, that's where we have the most reduced amount of inflammatory markers in each case, okay? And more significant than others, but you can see those dots there show that it's significantly uh, relevant or statistically relevant in, in, in many cases. And again, this was a paper we published last year on this. But we're, we're, we're doing a lot of work on that around, um, you know, before we move into the, the preclinical models, but it's, it's really at an advanced uh, stage of development here within the lab. So we're looking forward to moving to the next stage of this. But just while we talk about patients and while I mention this, this is one of our lead projects. So if anybody here is listening or and has any symptoms of dry eye or feels that they might have dry eye or knows anybody who has dry eye, please do reach out and touch this because at the moment, what we really want to do is make sure we're hearing that what we're developing could work for, for patients and, and we have ethical approval and so on for this. So, so don't worry, please feel free to put anybody in contact with us. Um, and it's just something that will be of interest to us to hear do our technologies really work. So I'm just going to finish up really talking about one of our larger consortiums. And I think Tess is on the call. She's our project manager for this and all things LTRG and really keeps things driving. But um, one of the things that we look at is, is this innovative training network. So this is something we got funded from a couple of years ago. Most of the funding is coming to that, well, over half of the Ireland, uh, is coming to the Island of Ireland between Queens, UCD and, and WIT. But what we're looking at here is we're targeting posterior segment diseases. And this is with 21 partners um, around Europe uh, and Canada and the US. And really to train 15 PhD researchers in, in the area of combined, uh, combined areas that would treat these diseases. Well, I'm, I'm kind of mentioning this is, you know, here are all our partners that we work with and it's great and we have lots of different expertise. So that's really, really important. So we hear lots of, we, we look at here, we have a hospital where we have a consultant ophthalmologist works with us. We have fight and blindness who I suppose really help us drive that patient perspective. And um, here are our great researchers. You'll notice three of them are, are based here in WIT. And this was just for the first time in, since we started, we got to have our year, year two meeting last week in uh, Santiago de Compostela, but really just bringing everybody together to talk about science from all over these countries. You can see we had about 60 people came uh, and were, were, were involved in, in it. So it was really great to kind of see people again. But, but what's interesting, I suppose, from this is as well last year, what we really, or last week, what we focused on, as I said, we're focused on the patient-led or patient-directed research that us as chemists and biologists can really hear what, what people are, what people need and what, what they're talking about. So we had this patient as a teacher workshop, and this was organized by, by, by Tess and the team here, but also the local team in Lisbon, um, and, and it, it was great, they did a great job putting this together. But just to show what we did first was we had many uh, I suppose training um, modules for our researchers to, to learn how to listen to what a patient might say or engage in, and then also to, to ask the right questions and how to relate their research to them. And we've been doing that really from the start of Orbital, and we try to link that to our own researchers here in WIT as well, that, that we realize we're not just scientists in a lab working on a nanoparticle or a contact lens, but that the end user is a, a human um, and who needs this, or it may help somebody for the technology. But what it led to then was this World Cafe and World Cafe are an organization that run these uh, around the world, I guess, where you have this very, um, I suppose, casual atmosphere. People drink coffee, they have discussions, you ask a question and they move around. But I mean, you know, you can see in this picture here where we have a clinician, a researcher, and then people living with sight loss and also the, the, their carers. And, and really, you're, you're hearing all the voices 
of, of people from here. And I was lucky enough to sit um, at this table with this particular gentleman, Zhao, and his, his care and his wife. And what, what really impressed me, what I was so amazed by and was so impactful was how much he wanted to talk about what he wanted to see in research, how much he knew about research and um, but you know what was being done, but also how much he cared about what future generations of researchers would work on. And it's really, I, I suppose, an interesting thing for us to, to, to work with and be part of and something that we're trying to incorporate more and more as, as we go on in this, because really, if we work in these isolated environments and, um, you know, where we're trying to develop a certain particle of a certain size, we never really hear what the right thing is for people um, who might need it in the end. So that, that's the end. I just want to thank the, the huge team of people that work on all these projects um, from around WIT. And here are our researchers, our postgraduate researchers, and um, former colleagues and, and continued external colleagues as well, and our funding body. Um, and here's all the, the, the references. So there's a lot of them thrown in there. But uh, thank you very much for listening. I'm sorry I went on a bit too long, but I forgot my stopwatch at the start. So. Thank you so much, Larry. That was really great. I found an outstanding presentation and I've learned so much today. And um, so I'm just going to open up the um, questions now to our participants on the call. If anybody would like to ask Larry any questions or do they have any comments about the presentation or need further clarification on anything? So anyone there got a question for Larry? Can I ask a question now? Yeah, sure, Sinead. <laughs> I, I must put my hands up and say I was late, so this may have kind of come up at the very start of the, the, um, the presentation. Is there any potential for um, using these chemicals in something like uh, embedded onto the surface of contact lenses um, for kind of more prolonged exposure to, for the patients? Yeah, no, absolutely. And and that was probably, and I, I don't know when you came in, did you see any of the stuff on contact lenses that we had at the Okay, start? sorry. No, I, yeah. I, I, no, cut, no, no. I cut my it's, hand it's, when I was making my No, lunch, no, no, so it's, it's no thinking, problem. Sorry, no, 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 yeah. no, happy. Just, I didn't want to be repeating it if you've already seen it and it was past that. No, so like, yeah, so one of our first things was, um, you know, to look at the potential for a bandage lens. Okay, so, you know, so, so bandage lenses are used fairly regularly. You know, if somebody has a corneal abrasion or they have some corneal injury, they, use, they can use it but it doesn't release any drugs. So what we're looking at is, can we put nanoparticles in there? We don't necessarily have to put nanoparticles. We're looking now at further, you know, printing the material on the, on the drug. That's where our next project is, is interested in looking at. And yeah, so there is, there's huge potential for it. And, and one of the first products has just been marketed and approved as well for, yeah. not ours, unfortunately, but. Because uh, it is quite, it um, it's quite closely related to a project that I was working on in SEAM where it was drug elution out of implants. Mm -hmm. um, and it was kind of having the, the drug embedded into the surface of the of the implant in that case. Yeah, so no, absolutely. It is interesting, right? It, it is, and thanks, Sinead. I mean, like the, 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 the potential for contact lenses, and many people, I know some people hate contact lenses and they don't like using them, uh, but, and, uh, but, but many people do find them quite useful. And then what we're looking at is, you know, can you just improve eye health by having, if you already have to wear contact lenses, there's something that we can add to the, to the lens that would even just prevent or improve the, the outcomes for some of these diseases, even before they uh, get to the, I suppose, the final stages or the more severe stages. Yeah. No, thanks, Larry. And it was very interesting. And sorry, I was late. No, no, no worries. Thanks. Thanks, Sinead. Um, Laurie, I have a question. So you mentioned there um, about the study and you put out a call there kind of for, for people, if you know anyone with dry eyes and stuff. So um, like, can you talk to us about the recruitment campaign? How are you going to approach it? Other than I know you've mentioned it here, but what is the robust campaign that you have in place? This is the first step of our recruitment campaign. So okay. we, 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 we actually, um, we've been working on this project since, well, a number of iterations, but more, most recently since last year. And we spent a while trying to make sure that we had the ethics in place. And thankfully, our, to be honest, our ethical committee really helped us getting that uh, organized and getting it through. So it was really towards the end of Christmas, uh, towards Christmas when that happened. And then our postdoc moved to greener pastures. Uh, so we've been a little bit slow down. So this is kind of kickstarting it again. So I wanted to mention it today. We're going to do a podcast with Rob. Next week, hello Rob, I see you on the call there. And we're going to that and we're going to mention it there. And then we're just going to have a kind of a social media campaign. We'll put it out through our different networks as well. We'll hopefully have a WIT research piece. And we'd, we'd really like to target people in the, 
I suppose, in our own community first, because I, I mean, I know that oftentimes when you talk to people, oh, I have a dry eye, or I know somebody with dry eye, and it's almost a thing that people don't necessarily think of at first, and then they do it. So I suppose it's, we have a phased approach, you know, we'll do a news piece, and we might even try to get a radio ad somewhere as well, and, and then we we'll link in with our collaborators to, to, to raise the awareness with, the, with, with people they know. Great, thanks, Larry. Well, happy to take any old advice on how we could do better with that. Even, so <laughs> if any suggestions, we'll take them. Oh yeah, we'll have a chat. <laughs> um, Geraldine has a question there. Thanks, Larry. Thanks for the presentation, Larry. I suppose the eye is an unusual mucosal surface, and you have various cell types present: the epithelial cell, but others. So I'm just wondering whether you've, and I think you would have considered this other models to predict exposure of different cell types to the drugs? Are you using mathematical modeling across the consortium? I mean, how is all this multidisciplinary expertise coming forth to predict that and to maybe move the field forward? Thanks yeah, a lot, no, yeah, no, no, great question. And it's a real topic of, of, of discussion for us in the group and for us, I would say in the field and specifically then the group and the consortium. And at our meeting last week, it was something that was uh, really pushed forward recently put in a, 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 a WIT uh, application and our next project is really going to focus on that because now we have a particle we have our cells and we look at corneal epithelial cells we look at regment, uh, retinal uh, cells we're also starting to look at conjunctible cells so we look at them in the cell-based models but then we're also looking at an next vivo tissue so you know um, so for example our, our porcine model where we're taking a look at that and we can look at the different elements of that and we got and as part of the consortium we got some great training and um, recently so we're taking that expertise back to WIT now where we can look at for example the slayer the white of the eye the choroid which is just behind that and then the different uh, surfaces on the eye and how the particles behave with those what we're going to look at next is combining let's say our our particles with a control gold nanoparticle and then using mathematical models to predict the difference between how one might behave in a cell, one behaves in, in an ex vivo model. And that's, that's kind of the, 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 the plan, you know? So it's really taking the mathematical aspects of it and being able to predict the pharmacokinetic behavior, the pharmacodynamic behavior in the body. And yeah, really just build on that. It's a, real, it's a real gap in the area at the moment. You know, people, you know, we test it and we look at it, but there's no real way of predicting it at the moment. So it's, it's, it's quite a difficult area. But as you say, because of all the barriers in the eye and the different kind of membranes and so on, it's, it's tricky. Thanks, Larry. Thanks, Larry. And Mark has a question. Hi, Mark. Quick question for, for you, Larry. Um, you've got loads of momentum going and loads of stuff uh, happening there. Where do you see, what's the big picture stuff? Like, where, where is this going to go over the next 10 years when we become a CU? Uh, good question. <laughs> so, no, I have, I have a number of answers for that. For us at the moment, what we want to focus on is really consolidating the expertise and consolidating the collaborations. You know, that's, that's really where we're at to start putting out the, the papers to focus on high, well, uh, you know, uh, I've, we, we all have issues about impact factors, but let's say good quality journals and relevant journals um, and really kind of get the information out there. From there, what we want to look at is really how we can drive the translation of the research. So to take it from the basic research to closer and closer to a, a model um, you know, or a, a commercial and marketed product. That's the real gap with nanotechnology. And I would say in a lot of times with biomedical uh, research as well, that we, you know, we have, it works well, great in the lab. But what are we doing to make sure that at every stage of translational research, and I think we put in a, unfortunately, not funded application last year for the SFI infrastructure, but what we really want to do is maybe build the expertise within the center and within the, within the department, and I guess within the TU as it, as it builds around the translation of that research and really being able to, you know, bring technologies further down the pipeline. Um, and rather than just, you know, taking it from the lab and get closer to the bench side, I suppose. So in terms of goals, that would be it. How we build it, we've got lots of ideas around that as well. I'm going to yeah, follow on then. So that just means a lot more clinical trials then. So stuff that you just mentioned there about the dry eye, about, about because that's how you're going to translate this into practice then. So that, yeah, that, absolutely and, right. Uh, but, but I would say that first, first there has to be better preclinical trials, you know, before it ever gets to the, the clinical trial. That's one of the, 
the big flaws. So if you take Dry, for example, there's something like 40 different uh, companies that have been trying to get a, dry, a new Dry Eye technology in the last couple of years. And there's been one approved, maybe two, you know, like there's this real kind of challenge. And a lot of them are focused on nano type technology. There's a real challenge between taking a nanotechnology or a combination device, like a drug a drug elution lens, to where it can actually go through approval to actually get to be put into a human eye, for example. So, so for us, it would be a lot of the building on the expertise that's in the PMBRC, for example, around materials characterization, around that kind of stuff that shows, well, okay, if we scale this up now to an industrial scale, uh, uh, let's say batch, does it still have the same properties? Will it still behave in the same way? And that's really where there's a huge gap, you know, and to encourage people that will support those clinical trials, you know, so, so I suppose that's it. Part of, you know, continuing those, you know, developing those networks with clinicians, people who work in the area and who can support those clinical trials, particularly those first in human trials at the start. I don't know if that answers your question. Hopefully it's so. yeah, Cheers, Larry. Thanks, Larry. Thanks, Larry. Anyone else want to ask Larry anything or you're all good? Um, so short and sweet. So I am um, just to bring the session to a close then, Larry, thank you so much um, for that really, really informative session and um, for giving up your time here today. And also, I just want to say thank you for always supporting and championing everything we do in the research office um, and around HR strategy for researchers. I, for one, am very grateful for your support. Um, and this is being recorded, so we'll be able to share it with anybody who missed the session. I know there were a few clashes for, for some people today. And um, um, yeah, and thank you all for joining in and for giving up your lunch break to hear the session today. So enjoy the sunshine or wherever you are. I'm not sure if it's shining where you are. I think we're expecting snow some parts of the country. So uh, yeah, that brings it to a close. So thanks a million, everyone. Thanks, Amar. And just to finish off, we wouldn't be able to do this without all the support of the research office and all the support you've given us over the years. So more than happy to help out wherever. And thanks for having us uh, to get to talk about research today. So much appreciate it.